two people are ready, I guess. I'm, it's wonderful. Hebrews 11, uh, verses 24 through 29, give kind of a synopsis of one of the greatest men of faith in the Bible. And not just believism, but true progressive faith. And that man was Moses. And the faith that Moses walked in, God has given, has injected, has installed in each and every one of us when we were born again, that spirit of faith. We all have it. And it is progressive faith, which means we're not talking about believism. We're not talking about saying, well, <clears throat> I'm reading in the scriptures these things about Jesus and I believe them. We're talking about um, not static beliefs, but active obedience to what you believe because you know it to be true. Progressive faith is a lifestyle. And so there are eight steps to progressive faith that are mentioned in this text. And we've today come down to the eighth, the final step. But let's read our text. The Bible says, by faith, there's number one, Moses, when he was come to years, when he grew up, refused, number two, to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Number three, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Number four, esteeming the reproaches of Christ to be greater riches than the treasures in Egypt because he had respect for the recompense of the reward. By faith, number five, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he, number six, endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he, number seven, kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, this morning, number eight, they passed. Everyone say, passed. They passed through the Red Sea as if on dry land, which the Egyptians attempting to do were drowned. Now, <clears throat> I've said it, but I, I want to repeat it. It's an important phrase. Uh, you need to put this to, uh, put it in a, 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 a place in your heart where it can inform how you walk with God. And that is that God's heart is touched by the desperate needs of people, but, but it's progressive faith that actually moves him to deliver. So while it might seem in, inappropriate to say that God is not moved to action to deliver simply by the needs of people, it is technically true. What moves him is progressive faith. And so God is always trying to get us to hear his words, believe them, and act upon them because God is faithful to his word. That's the basis for God's actions when he takes them on our behalf. God wants to heal the whole world. For God so loved the world, he gave his son. But we have to take hold of his son. And it is the same with that is progressive faith. And so taking hold and walking in progressive faith has steps to it. And we've, we've taught on these first seven steps. Faith, Moses began when he came to years because faith requires a decision to grow up spiritually. Second, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And so walking by faith begins with refusing to stay in your present conditions. And then it says choosing rather the afflictions of God's people than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Progressive faith is made by choosing our needs over our wants. And then the Bible says, He esteemed the reproaches of Christ to be better riches than the treasures of Egypt. And so progressive faith esteems the favor of God over the pursuits of man. So these are all steps that we need to take in our life for faith to really lead up to the moment where miracles are flowing freely through our life. Um, and it says forsaking. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Progressive faith 
fearlessly forsakes the things that resist the change God's wanting to bring in your life. And so if we're not resisting those, if, if we're not forsaking the things that are, are resisting the Spirit of God in our life, we can pray for those changes to come, but we're our own worst enemy. We're fighting against the very change we're praying for. And last week we shared about the fact that Israel kept the covenant. And it's important in, um, for us to keep covenant with God so that we can put ourselves in a position where God can move. And finally today, we've come down to this final step. They passed through the Red Sea. Now, if you haven't read it in your Bibles, I'm sure everyone has, but maybe if you haven't, you saw the movie. And um, in the movie, you know that Moses is out living in the wilderness, and he's, for 40 years, he's just been a shepherd, and he sees the burning bush, and God is on in the fire that's on the bush, and he turns aside to see that great sight, and he has an encounter with God. God speaks to him, and God says, I've called you to go back to Egypt. And Moses says, well, I've been 40 years out here, and I was a failure when I tried to deliver uh, the Jews before, and I can't even talk straight anymore. All my education seems to have worn off. And uh, he was just reticent. He didn't have the boldness. But the Lord talked to him and got him straightened out. And then the Lord looked at him and said, What do you got in your hand, by the way? He said, Oh, that's my shepherd's staff. And you know how the Lord said, Throw it down on the ground. He threw it down on the ground, turned into a serpent. He says, Now pick it up. And he picked it up. Um, and that's why God sent a man instead of a woman, because we know no woman would pick up a snake. <laughs> So, um, in any rate, um, he picks up that staff and God says, now go to Egypt and the Lord was with him. And he goes to Pharaoh and he says, God sent me and God says, deliver his people. And the Pharaoh said, I'm not going to set the slaves free. That's our economy. And he says, well, you better because the power of God is here and bad things are going to happen to you if you resist him. And sure enough, there was just one plague after another. And uh, <clears throat> Moses would put his staff over the sea and it would turn to blood. And he'd wave his staff in the air and the uh, um, pestilence would come. And then finally, after the death angel passes over and the firstborn of everyone's house is, is, dies uh, under the, the attack of the death angel, Pharaoh's finished. He has no more resistance left in him. And he says, okay, just take them and just go. And Moses says, well, we're going to go, but we need to borrow some things. <laughs> and so they get all the gold. They go borrow all the gold and all the wealth and the oil and, and all the money. And so now there's about three million people, and they're, they're leaving uh, Goshen, where they've lived in Egypt as slaves, and they're dragging all this stuff with them, and um, they're... It's probably singing and rejoicing, you know, some, some He has set me free, glory, hallelujah, He has set me free song. And <clears throat> they get up to the Red Sea. And we didn't see this coming. Um, and in the meantime, they get up to the Red Sea, which, you know, is obviously a barrier. They, they could find a way around it. But here come the Egyptians with their chariots and soldiers. Pharaoh, uh, it, it just, he couldn't... Uh, he just couldn't bear it, and, and it stuck in his craw, and he said, I'm not going to let them go. And he calls his chariots, and he goes chasing after them. So now they're up against the Red Sea, and they've got the Egyptians barreling down on them. And the Bible says, you know the scene, that um, Moses stretched out that rod, and he commanded, and those waters parted, and they went over on dry ground. And that word is passed. They passed through the Red Sea. So I want to break this down for you and talk with you about passing. The progressive life of faith always leads to a moment where you pass through the final barrier. You pass into God's state of healing or deliverance or that next level that he's wanting to bring you to. So after Moses, by faith, refused, chose, esteemed, forsook, endured, and Israel kept the covenant, progressive faith brought them to the Red Sea 
where the waters parted as they passed through on God's highway of miracles. Hallelujah. So let me say this to you. Progressive faith always leads to miracles. If you're a Christian and you want to live a life of progressive faith, you must be prepared to see miracles happen in your life. Progressive faith. There, I don't know of a situation in the scriptures where God leads his people to where he calls them and leads them to a life of progressive faith where they don't encounter obstacles too big, dilemmas too great, and God's provided a miracle. God's answer is always a miracle to get over that situation. So progressive faith leads always to miracles. And when you walk in progressive faith, it affects what you want. It affects what you see. It affects where you go. And it affects what you do. What you want, what you see, where you go, and what you do must come under the influence of progressive faith. And so let's start with what you want. Hallelujah. What you want. God always puts us in a position and causes you to want things that you can't have. It starts with wanting something that you can't have. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, the Bible talks about Hannah, who was barren. And uh, the other woman, back then, men had multiple wives, so the other woman was living in the house with you. Can you imagine a situation like that? And so she was heartbroken because the other woman was having all kinds of babies all over the place. She couldn't have one. And so <clears throat> every year they'd go up to the temple to offer offerings annually to the Lord, and Hannah was just crying her eyes out, brokenhearted because she couldn't have children. And the other woman would drive her crazy, tormenting her, and just, just jabbing at her, calling her names. And the scripture says her husband favored her, even though she couldn't have children. She's not the only one in the Bible like that. Rachel was like that. And so there were, God's always used these barren women. Have you ever noticed that? So if you've ever felt barren in some area of your life and you think God should find somebody that's more gifted, God's not looking for gifted people. God's looking for desperate people. So listen to this. It says, but to Hannah, her husband gave a double portion because he loved her though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, the other woman, used to provoke her grievously to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So here's Hannah. She's grieved miserably and tormented and agitated and crying out to God year after year. Most of us in that situation would say, Lord, Take away my pain. Lord, redirect my desires. Help me to get over this so that I don't want this anymore. Give me a ministry that I can do so I won't long to have children. Are you with me? God didn't want Hannah to get over wanting children. He wanted her to yearn. He wanted her to ache for them even more. And so sometimes when you think that you're not getting your answer from God, God is simply sharpening the point on your pencil. He's just drawing out that desire until it's absolutely the one thing. Because David said, one thing have I desired, that also will I seek, that I might dwell. God is oftentimes waiting until that half a dozen things that we've divided our interest in our heart by become set aside until it's the one thing that we come to God and we say, Lord, I can live without all this other stuff, but I must have this. God wants you to want something that you can't have. Because not having it intensifies your desire for it. And that's how God creates a Samuel. 
You say, where does God get people like Samuel? Samuel saved Israel in one of their darkest hours. He, he produces Samuels in the desperate, pain-ridden womb of barren women, barren Christians who are wanting something that nature says you can't have it. Nature has already disqualified you and said you can't have it. You're barren. You can't have a child. Yet God, God, rather than giving her peace, let her become beside herself. That's how God produces a Samuel. And so when you walk the walk of progressive faith, it causes you to want things that you can't have. Did you know that it also causes you to see things that you shouldn't be able to see? How many of you have said at one point in your life, I just don't get this. I can't see this. The Lord isn't opening my understanding. I don't see this. <clears throat> it's being kept from me. But God wants you to see things that you are not able to see. Um, how many of you remember the story of the prophet Elisha and his servant Gehazi? And they're in the city of Dothan. And the enemy has chased them into that city and surrounded them because the enemy wants to kill the prophet Elisha. Because every time the enemy goes to form a battle plan against Israel, Elisha goes and asks God, what's the devil up to? And he says, well, they're planning to attack you in the valley of whatever. And so the king of Israel goes out there and foils their plot. And it just kept happening. And so they, the enemy, the kings of the enemy got together and said, what's going on here? Every time we go to form a battle plan, um, there's a spy among us. And they told them, no, there's no spy. They got a prophet. His name's Elisha, and God shows him everything that we plan on doing. So they said, well, you know what? Rather than fighting with all Israel, let's just go kill the prophet. You ever felt like the whole army of the enemy was focused on you? Do you wonder why that's happening? Because the devil knows, I'll just take her out. If I take her out, the whole family will fall. You know you're the one. Hallelujah. And so... <clears throat> There's, there's the prophet Elisha. He's laying on his bed one morning. And Gehazi, his young servant, goes out to the castle wall. And he looks out. And he comes running in, blood drained from his face, white like a sheet. And he says, man of God, man of God, <clears throat> we're in big trouble. The enemy has surrounded the castle with chariots and spearmen and archers and <clears throat> instruments of war. And the prophet of God, Elisha, says... Chill out, man. Our army is bigger than their army. Don't worry about it. And then he prayed. And he said, Father, open up my servant's eyes so that he can see what's really going on. And so after he prayed, he said, I want you to go back out the wall. Look, look around again. And he went out and he saw, and beyond the army of the enemy, the hills surrounding Dothan were filled with chariots of fire. God's angel army had surrounded the army that surrounded Elisha. <laughs> I got to laugh just preaching and I get excited about it. It just gives me God bumps. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, God wants you to see things that you're not allowed to see, that you can't see. Things that are real, but you can't see them. God wants to open your eyes and make you to see them. Did you know that besides wanting things you can't have, seeing things that you can't see, God wants you to go places that you shouldn't be able to go? For example, the, the story of, of uh, the deliverance of the Israelites. You're not supposed to walk through the sea. But God dried up a path, didn't he? They went somewhere they weren't supposed to go. God wants you. Are you willing? And let me just put it in the form of a question. Are you willing to go somewhere you're not supposed to go? I'm not talking about what you did last week. I'm talking about where God is trying to lead you. And many of, many of you are avoiding it because you're, 
You've been trained like a little pet. Don't go there. I'm barred. I can't go there. I can't do that. Do you remember when Peter walked on water? How did Peter walk on water? Peter sees Jesus walking on the water. He didn't say, teach me to do that. Did he? The whole lesson was not about walking on water. You know what the whole lesson was about? Come to Jesus. So Peter's in the boat with the rest of the disciples and being impetuous and bold as he is, he said, Lord, if it's you, invite me to come to you. Jesus said, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and he walks on the water. It's not about walking on the water. It's about coming to Jesus. Listen, there's a huge point here about going where you're not supposed to be able to this. The key to Peter walking on water was that he had to do it in order to get to Jesus. I don't think you heard me. Let me say it again. I'm going to try English this time. The key to walking on water was he had to do it in order to get to Jesus. The point was getting to Jesus. Look, when the Lord positions himself in your life somewhere in front of you. Forget about whatever barriers or impossibilities or restrictions lie between you and what God is calling you into. Are you listening to me? You're in the boat, there's water, and then there's Jesus. When, when Jesus positions himself before you and then gives you permission to come to him, you can pass through any barrier, any restriction to get to him because your permission to come to him gives you the authority to pass through those restrictions that lay between you and Jesus. Were it not for the fact that Jesus was on the other side of that valley of fire, you couldn't walk through fire. You shouldn't be able to go there. Every sense within you and your mama would tell you, don't go walk through that fire. But if Jesus is over on the other side and he says, come, guess who's going to walk through fire? You are. Did not Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego do it? There is no restriction and no barrier. None. What is it right now in your life that the Lord is calling you into? Where do you see that Jesus has positioned himself and is calling you to take a step? And you're thinking, I can't go there. I don't have the money. I can't do that. I don't have the education. I can't go to this place. But you can come to Jesus. You're right, you can't go there. You're right, you can't walk through fire. You're right, you can't walk on water. But you can come to Jesus because Jesus gives you permission to do it. Let me say it again. Jesus gives you permission to come to him. If I know God's called me to do something, then it's because I see Jesus in that thing saying, Nick, come here. I see that work. I see that calling. I see that vision. Jesus is in it. He's saying, come here, Nick. Come here. Yeah, but Lord, I, I can't go there. I'm not qualified. I don't have the provisions. What am I doing? I'm looking at the water. It's not about the water. It's not about the restrictions. It's not about the barriers. As long as you continue to make it about coming to Jesus, you can go places you're not supposed to go. And that was a principle they were about to learn at the banks of the Red Sea. Fourthly, when you live a life of progressive faith, you will do things that you shouldn't be able to do. Like fly. Now, I have never heard of anyone flying without an airplane. But I think that if God needed somebody to fly without an airplane, they would do it. How many of you know about a guy named Philip? Exactly. Acts 8 and 39. Right? Did he do something he's not allowed to do, not supposed to do, not able to do? Did he do it? Why did he do it? Because he was fulfilling his ministry. He was on the path. Remember, progressive faith always leads to miracles. Why? Because progressive faith never deviates from the will of God. 
The life of progressive faith isn't for people who go out and live their own will and then want the blessings of God to be upon their will and so that they'll be prospered and, and they'll have the life, they'll have their best life now. Progressive faith and the highway of God's miracles is for people who hear God call them. Now, every single Christian is called. Not, and, and most of those callings have nothing to do with coming up into a pulpit and preaching. Most of those callings have to do with being a mother or a father or a Christian businessman or a worker or a faithful friend or a neighbor and bringing Christ into those relationships, into those situations in your life. That is as much a vision and a purpose of God as the missionary who God says, I want you to sell everything and go to Antarctica. Well, Lord, there's not even any people there. There will be when you get there. That, that would be a step of faith. We think, well, now that's a ministry. You can do things you shouldn't be able to do, just like Philip. The Bible says after he preached to the Ethiopian eunuch and led him to the Lord, that same transport obviously was standing by and just he disappeared and reappeared in another city somewhere. And I mean, where do you think Gene Rodberry got the idea? Yeah, no, don't look him up on Amazon. It's not going to help. Gene Roddenberry wrote Star Trek. He was the author of Star Trek. Remember, beam me up, Scotty? So yeah, Jesus was the first one to use that matter transport uh, device. So when you are walking in your calling, there's nothing you can't do to accomplish God's purpose. Nothing. Whatever God's purpose is, you can do it if God's called you to do that thing, because just like going where you're not allowed to go, you can't fly, so don't even begin to try to worry about how to do it. God's the one who sends you. He's the one who makes the miracles happen. Praise God. How about Joshua? Man, how about Joshua? He's watching Moses. He's watching the rod of God. He's seeing all this stuff. And uh, then Moses leaves and Joshua's got all the burden of Israel on his shoulders. What about Joshua? He finds himself in the valley of Ajalon fighting the Amorites. And they're a nasty, particularly nasty bunch. And he's fighting them all day long in this hot valley. And he's just about got them beat. But the sun's going down and they're in a bowl surrounded by mountains. And he sees them beginning to scurry up the hills and he knows that when the... When the sun goes down, they're going to escape and they're going to go back and regroup and they're going to come back at him with stronger numbers and fight him again tomorrow. So he wants to kill them all right now, but he's run out of sun. He's run out of time. What does he do? He prays and says, Lord, stop the sun. Stop the sun. Now, God did not stop the sun. God did not, you know, make the, the earth all of a sudden stand still. Everything would just go flying off. We'd be... Spinning off into space. But God did something. He, in effect, stopped the effect of the sun, froze it, and there was that extra day. And there's some really cool stuff about that, but um, it's not pertinent to the message. The point is that the Bible says there was never a day before or after it like that when, the, when God hearkened to the voice of a man. You can do things that you shouldn't be able to do. Listen, if you are willing to let God lead you through unconventional, unpopular, inconceivable, and unbelievable ways to do His will, you'll end up passing through miracles just like Moses and the children of Israel. Just like that, praise the Lord. Listen, there's a thing called the ins and outs of God. How many of you ever heard the phrase, well, the ins and outs of this thing? How's it work? Well, let me share with you the ins and outs of it. Well, God has a thing called the ins and outs of God. Let me tell you what it is. It's, it's about God's transitioning point between where he's bringing you from and to what he's bringing you into. It's all about transitioning out of what you need to abandon 
so that you can enter in to God's will, the ins and outs of God. So like the Israelites backed up against the Red Sea, there's no reason for the Israelites to come out of Egypt and come out as free men if they're not going to enter in to the promised land. If they have no, t no intention, if they don't have the courage, if they don't have the faith to go into the promised land and into God's will, then they have no business coming out of Egypt. Why come out if you're not going to enter in? Many Christians become saved. Step one, they come out and then they never enter in. They never take a step farther. They never really enter into what God has for them. But with God, it's not just coming out of the world, it's coming in. And there's a transition point. There's a transition point because there's a point where you and I must decide to choose the will of God. And there's always miracles involved in it. And God wants you involved in those miracles. Hallelujah. All seven steps were taken by Israel, and then they find themselves up against the Red Sea. And then Moses cries out to God, Lord, deliver us. What's happening? After those seven steps of faith, choosing, refusing, esteeming, forsaking, all of that, now they're backed up against the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army has got them pinned at the shoreline, and they're about to be annihilated. Moses, would you cry out to God? Yeah, sure. Moses cried out to God. Guess what? God cried out to Moses. God turned right around and cried right back. Moses said, God, help us. And Moses, God cries back to Moses and says, are you ready for this? Why are you crying to me? You have our staff. Use it. Now see, if I were sitting out there and I heard that, I'd be popped up. <laughs> running around doing something. Because that, that, that's just amazing. Why, why are you crying out to me, God said? You've got our staff. You know our staff, our stick. We share it. You know, remember what it did in, in Egypt and everything? Use it. So God won't let Moses cry out to him. Why is that? God turns around, puts it right back on Moses. Why is that? Because this final step of passing through is so critical, and you need to hear this. If you've, if you've wondered what this is all about, here it is. God had become so integrated with Moses through the whole process of, of their walk together in progressive faith that he and Moses had a oneness between them. And God had become so integrated with him that he now wanted to act through Moses and not just for Moses. Just like Peter at the gate, I give what I have. God wants to act through you, not for you. Up till that point, he acts for you because he's training you how to believe God. He's training you how to walk in faith. But now it's time to pass the test. And now you're up again. And have you ever noticed that, <laughs> have you ever noticed that the Red Sea is always the last straw? How does that, that those two ideas always seem to intersect? When you're up against the Red Sea, you've run out of energy. You've run out of grace. You've run out of patience. You're, you've used everything to accomplish those first seven steps. You've got nothing left. All you're doing is sobbing and going, God, please help, please help, please help. God says, stop blubbering. Why are you blubbering at me? Take what little bit of strength you've got left. Lift the stick. Use our staff. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let me uh, close by sharing with you the history of our staff. In, in Exodus 4, 1 and 2, Moses is standing at the burning bush, and God said, 
what is that in your hand? And the scripture says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Moses said, a staff. Everyone say, a staff. So when you came to God, what you had in your hand was just a staff, okay? Your life, a staff. And then further in Exodus, after God had spoken to him through the burning bush and, and had touched that staff and gave him his orders, the Bible says he took his wife and his sons and he headed out towards Egypt. And listen to how it describes when he was headed out towards Egypt on God's mission. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. And in his hand, he carried the staff of God. So a staff has now become the staff of God. You know, when you got saved, there was things that was just a life. But now it's the life of God. There were things in you very common. What is he always oh, just a dude? Oh, that's, she's just a girl. It's just a life. It's just my job. It's just some money. It's just my marriage. But now it's God's marriage, God's life, God's money, God's house, God's man, God's woman. He took God's staff and he went to Egypt. <laughs> so now he's gone through this tremendous adventure, the plagues, everything. Pharaoh lets them go, and then, and then Pharaoh changes his mind, and they're at the Red Sea, right? And they're certain they're about to be annihilated. And God says, talks about the staff, God speaks to him and says, Why cry out to me? Pick up your staff, raise your hand over the sea, divide the water so that the Israelites can walk through. Are you listening to what God is saying to Moses to do? This is God's instruction to a man. And it starts with, pick up your staff. Now it's gone from being a staff, God's staff. Now what is it? Your staff. A staff, generic, has become God's staff, God-empowered. Now, through the process of walking in progressive faith, God says it's now your staff, your staff. You can do this. You've got this. God's with you. It was always going to be about you going forth. It was always, when God called you, it was always going to end up being you taking big, huge strides. Hallelujah. And God says, pick up your staff, raise your hand over the sea. You divide the water so the Israelites can walk. I would, if I were Moses, I'd be thinking, divide the water, divide the water. No time to think about it. Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Now look, let's be very specific. I want you to think with me. God has just told him, Stretch out your hand, stretch out the staff, and divide the water. He's now told a man to do something he can't do. What is progressive faith? It is knowing that if God has told you to do it, then God intends to do it through you, but he will not do it apart from you. Passing through has to do with letting God do through you what he absolutely will not do apart from you. You can part the Red Sea. Now, if you're thinking that you can go out and part the Gulf of Mexico, I invite you after church to go down there and just knock yourself out on Clearwater Beach. I doubt that the Gulf of Mexico is going to part. Why? Because step eight follows step one through seven. God's plan, God's purpose, a life lived in obedience, step by step. He came up to that moment, and everything he had gone through up till that point had set him up to be able to hear God say, part the Red Sea. And he did it. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So when you come to the Red Sea and it's time to pass through, then God's staff has become your staff. All right, it's time to turn this into an altar call. How are we going to pray about this? 
What does all this mean for you and I sitting in this sanctuary, downtown Clearwater, on the 10th of October in the year 2021? I don't know about you. Maybe you have to be old as I am. But doesn't that get you every time it comes out of your mouth? 2021. I thought we were going to be the Jetsons in 2021 when I was a kid. His boy, Elroy, flying around in the little saucer. But here we are, 2021. What does this mean for us as Christians? Are we just parked here waiting for the rapture bus to come? Hello, rapture bus. All you Christians in there, come on out and get in. Get you all out of here. As the church, once again in history, now in 2021, heads back into a time of turbulence and trouble. Belligerent tyrants want to enslave God's people. And divine deliverance is the only way to defeat their malevolent schemes. The church is heading into dark times again. Not our darkness, but the darkness of tyrants who want to bring this nation and the whole world under their tyranny. From Satan's camp, he believes in 2021 that this is his this is his time. The moons have all lined up. The Antichrist can now prepare. They got him lined up in the chute. And this is his moment. And the world is foaming at the mouth, losing their minds, going crazy. People are choosing evil over good. They are turning away from prosperity and health. And they're literally running headlong into bondage, slavery, and destruction. How do you explain what's happened since the last election? How do you explain that? You, you, you can't just say, well, one man's an idiot. And that answers everything. Because that, that, that doesn't answer it. There is a world. There is a world movement going on here. And uh, even people who think they are in power don't realize that they're just simply puppets and invisible powers and principalities. Demonic agents are moving the world. And you and I are the church, the light of the world. We're the light of the world. What are we doing here? <clears throat> Once again, <coughs> the church is in the crosshairs of malevolent tyrants. These people that want to destroy this nation and destroy the world and bring it under their control and domination, they don't have in their crosshairs the unsaved people of the world. Trust me, it's the church because we are the problem. We are the trouble. If you want to bring the world into tyranny, the church, the active church, the people who live in progressive faith, they're your real problem. They were Pharaoh's pain in the neck, and they have been ever since. So what is our altar call today? We have come into the time of darkness, and now our job is to shine. And more specifically, God's answer is exactly what it was for Moses and the people of Israel, divine deliverance. If you think that the job of the church is to be anything less than a supernatural delivering force in the midst of this tyranny, then you are mistaken. God's answer is miracles. God's answer is miracles through you and I. God's answer is you and I take up our staff and enter the path of progressive faith because there's a Red Sea coming. And you and I must lead many people through it, and we need to be ready. I no longer say, and I never was big on, I was never a big follower of Bible prophecy. I understood it, but I, you know, I wasn't one of these people who was glued to the, the latest book that came out about signs and wonders. Really, frankly, didn't pay much attention to them because I knew what was going on. We're cruising right into it. Now, I also knew this, and I know it today, that 
When the real darkness shows up, people won't know it until, they're, until they've been swallowed. Satan has had the church in its jaws, and he's beginning to gulp. And you and I need to wake up and realize, because what we have been concerned about, what we've been writing all these books about, and uh, making movies about, is not something that's around the corner. It is here. It's happening. These are the, what do they call those when a woman's about to go into labor and you get those first, yeah, those contractions. The, yes, I feel the contractions. Now, you all can put your head in the sand and say this, this is just, oh, it's going to turn around. And that's a funny thing about contractions. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, wait, no, it's okay. Let's time this. There seems to be a pattern. Contractions. We're heading for the Red Sea. We're in the tractor beam of Bible prophecy. What do you and I need to do right now? We need to get ready for deliverance. The answer for the world is revival. Our revival. Souls need to get saved. We need to get ready. There are many people God wants to deliver and bring out of darkness. There are are three million people living in Tampa Bay. Three million, that's a lot of people. Right here in Pinellas County, one million souls. You think, well, there's churches everywhere. Our church, we have a small church. Um, and there are big churches. But you put them all together, we are still a drop in the bucket compared to this population. Outside these doors this morning, there are tens of thousands of people who have received Jesus in their life and then have let the devil divert them. And they're not in fellowship. They're not going to church. They're not fulfilling the word. They've just got a belief in Jesus in their heart. And only God knows whether their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But they're out there. They've never completed the step they took at one point, maybe as a young person. They're waiting for somebody to stand before them in whom Jesus is standing. They need to finish this thing. So there's a lot of people that need to get back into fellowship with God. Then there's people like I was, total heathens. I mean, totally on their way to a devil's hell, God-hating atheists. Lots of them. It's exactly what I was, and they're out there, and Jesus loves them. And many of them are, are ordained to eternal life. God wants to reach them. But they need to run into men and women like you and I who have walked in progressive faith and are ready to stand in front of that Red Sea that's preventing them from getting saved and reach out, make that connection, and bring them to Jesus. It is deliverance and revival. The ability to say, rise up and walk. The ability to say, silver and gold of I number, such as I have, I give to you. When you're done talking and you can't convince them with your words, you've got to be able to say, would you like to see God in action? Would that help you? What's that big bunyat you got on the side of your face or whatever? When we were up north, bunyat, as the Italians call it, a big old growth up there, whatever. And snatch it off in the name of Jesus. Say, let me lay my hands on that. Jesus is going to hit it with some compound J. Hallelujah. And, and let God move. It's time. It's time. So I want you to close your Bible or turn off your device. 